In the book of Ephesians, Paul wrote a letter to explain who we are and what we have in Christ. At the time in history that Paul wrote this letter, Christians were on the run. They had no rights. They were in great danger. Paul actually wrote this letter while on house arrest in Rome. And despite his circumstances, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, describing the fullness and richness of life in Christ. The letter to the Ephesians explained what it meant to be in Christ, to be the church, the body of Christ. Paul knew that if the Ephesians understood who they were and began to live in Christ, the world would never be the same. The same can be true for our church today. If we understand what it means to live in Christ, to be the church, our city and our world would never be the same. So as you heard through our video, we are in the book of Ephesians. And so as we said today, we'll be in chapter 4, verse 4. This section, as we turn into chapter 4 in the book of Ephesians, it's the great turn, the great transition. For the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, we find out all the glories of the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the plan that the Father had put forth before the earth was even created? A plan was put forth to unite all things under Christ and not only unite all things under Christ but to adopt a people as his own to be children of God and so I always remind you guys that it's a wonderful thing that we are in right relationship with God and this is a glorious incredible thing but we're not just in right relationship with God because of what Jesus accomplished we are actually children of God he is our father we are inheritance of something absolutely amazing and wonderful because of the plan of the Father. We are made holy and blameless, not because you in of yourself are holy and blameless, but because what Jesus has accomplished through the cross. We are reminded that it's because of his blood we have redemption. We have the perfectness of who Christ is then imputed to ourselves and then our sin and our failures and our missteps and our mistakes and all of our garbage is then given to Jesus and Jesus died for that he took the sin that we had and laid it upon the cross and did what we could not do he paid that price for us for that all who would believe all those who would repent who would turn and then follow after Jesus would not perish but have everlasting life and then if, if that isn't enough we find out in the first chapter that it's the Holy Spirit that then seals us the Holy Spirit guarantees us until we take possession of it and this is incredible what God has put forth this amazing plan from eternity past to unite all things under Christ to make us a people that are unworthy but we are now holy and blameless before God because of what Jesus has done and then we see in chapter 2 the gospel put in such plain and beautiful terms. Instead of the overarching plan of the Father that we see in chapter 1, we then see in chapter 2 that who we are as individuals is not pretty. We are dead in our sins. We are spiritually dead. We can do no good in, when it comes to what God has called us to do. But then in verse 4, we see those amazing words. We see, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. And then in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is a gift. And it's not of works so that none of us can boast. And then as we continue, we see now how the gospel doesn't just penetrate from the grand scale as well as the individual scale, but the gospel penetrates in cultures and communities and all around us. The gospel takes people groups and then unites these people groups together. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And we see this mystery in chapter 3 being unfolded for us. And that the mystery from, from generations past is revealed because of who Jesus is now. That we get to behold the beauty and the wonder of what has been a mystery. You and I today can know who Jesus is because of this. 
And so as we continue through chapter 3, Paul then unpacks the gospel, and then we look at chapter 4. But you might say, if, especially those who have been journeying with us through the book of Ephesians, you may ask yourself, Tony, that's great. You've said that probably for six months in a row. What I just said, you've heard over and over. But I, I want to encourage you today. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and safe for you. Well, I'm not claiming to be past, or, uh, Apostle Paul this morning, but I am saying that this morning, it's no trouble for us to remind ourselves week after week the glories of the gospel. And it should be no trouble for, for us to hear this and be reminded and be encouraged week after week what it is that God has done, his great love for you, what he has had to accomplish to unite us as a people group together. I mean, it's incredible to just sit and think on that week after week, day after day, hour after hour. But then Paul turns in to chapter 4. And so as Paul wraps up chapter 3, he begins to go into now, how do we take this gospel and how do we apply it? It's one thing for us to know the gospel, but just knowing the gospel isn't enough. We need to now take what we know and put it into practice. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 through 3 says this, I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord, this is Paul speaking, urge you to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It is in the unity of the Spirit here that we see, and the bond of peace that Paul now then turns to share these profound next three verses. So let's look at these next three verses together. Chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. This is one amazing set of verses. So let's just take this one step at a time. I got one jokes all day long today, just so you know. So we're going to take this one step at a time, and we're going to look at these three verses, and we're going to see how they actually work. First, what Paul is saying, let's note this, that he's giving us a way to carry out the gospel in verses 1 through 3. He's urging us to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling. But then Paul tells us how we should walk. We should walk humbly. We should walk gently. We should be patient, and we should do it with love. And what's the purpose behind this? It's all to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It is with this in mind that Paul is actually going to stop the application for just a moment and he's going to go back to doctrine in these next three verses. So before we dive in, let me help set up where we're about to see. As we look at these verses, we're actually seeing them listed in triads and we're going to begin with the first three of body, spirit, and hope. Then next week, we're going to look at Lord, faith, and baptism and finally with God the Father. But next within these triads, look at this. We actually see in these verses the Trinity. First, the Holy Spirit, and then the Lord Jesus Christ, and then finally we see God the Father, which may seem strange to us because normally when we think about the Trinity, we think of God the Father, then the Son, and then the Holy Spirit in that order. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So why do you think Paul did Spirit, then Jesus, then Father? Well, I think we'll get into that as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. So at the beginning of this verse, chapter 4, verse 4, we see this. There is one body. Now the body Paul is referring to here is the church. So if you're taking notes and you see body and you want to circle that, it's put that that is talking about the church. If you are a repentive believer, you are part of the body of Christ. You are part of the church. And Paul uses the illustration of this body. He actually uses that earlier in Ephesians. He uses it in chapter 1, 22 through 23. He says this, And he, the Father, put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
So Paul is going to be using different illustrations to help us understand the church and how it works. Paul uses things like a kingdom. He uses a family. In chapter 2, Paul is going to say a temple. But Paul loves using this body analogy as an illustration as it plays out. A body is something that works together. Now, as we look at ourselves and we look at how we are created and how everything works, we'll find out that it is with all of our parts working together that we're able to accomplish the things that we are called to accomplish. Even here, speaking about God's word takes many different aspects. You even being able to listen to God's word takes many aspects of the body to make that happen. And Paul goes into great detail in 1 Corinthians 12. So let me read this to you this morning. In 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 20, Paul says this, For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong in the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong part of the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were... If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So when Paul is referring to the body, he's referring to us as a whole of individuals. And so what we see here as we begin to understand what the body means, what Paul is talking about when he says there's one body, he is talking about us as a group of believers coming together, having all of our unique abilities, our unique designs, our unique functions, and we're all working together so that we can accomplish the goal that God has called us to do. This is why it's, it's so important that we understand how we all work together. But if we understand this idea of a body and we understand that we are all needing to come together, united under Christ to accomplish the will that God has put forth, then we're going to find ourselves doing something really unique. We're going to find ourselves, not one of us being put above another. We're going to find ourselves all working together where one isn't elevated and one isn't put down. We're going to see that each one of you here with us today as a believer in Christ have a role, have a part to play in God's kingdom. So it doesn't mean that if at any point you feel too lowly, like there's nothing that I can do, there's nothing I contribute, I don't have a lot that I can really be a part of. That's not true. God has gifted you and equipped you in a special way to be able to do what he is called to do while you are a part of us. You see, this actually destroys the idea of celebrity pastors or the concept of super Christians. We're all in this together and we can do nothing of worth or value apart from the other. But in reality, the problem that we have, especially in our American culture, is we, we celebrate the famous. We celebrate people of great status. I mean, have you gone to a checkout line in a grocery store? You see all these magazines. It's all about different celebrities. If you turn through all the different radio, the most popular thing is celebrity gossip. And of course, we're glued to it because we want to know what so-and-so did with so-and-so or didn't do with so-and-so. It's all about who is important. And you've heard this saying, I'm sure you've heard it, that there's no I in team. But there is an M and an E. So that kind of messes that up. But so you hear these different ideas and you hear this, but you're like, is this really true? How does this all work? But this is not what we see when it comes to the church. This is why there should be no celebrity in the church. One of my uh, favorite compliments that has ever been given to me as I was... Uh, you know, greeting people at the door as they were leaving was this. Said, Pastor, I was really blessed by the word of God today. Thank you for sharing it. What was elevated there was not me. It was not elevated, you know, what I was able to do or how I was able to, uh, you know, share funny stories or anything. It was the word of God. That's what should be blessing us this morning. It's God's word. It's not me. Because if I am put upon a pedestal or, or made to be something great, first of all, that's something that I can't handle. That's something that I'm never meant to shoulder. Because we are all together equal. We are all together made lovely and wonderful for the work of Christ. God has gifted me with talents and abilities. And he's gifted me with the ability to do some 
certain things, but it's not for the raising of myself. It's for his glory and his purpose. God also gave me weaknesses. You'd be amazed at how many weaknesses I have by talking to my wife. There are plenty. I mean, they're all over the place. But Paul has given other people strength in the body. Uh, Paul and Jerry, if you haven't had a chance to meet with them, uh, they are super gifted in administration. Maggie, who's over here as well, amazing with compassion and care. Sherry, who greets at the door, hospitable and fun and laughing all the time. My wife is create, or gifted in creating systems, and I am gifted in needing systems. So we work together <laughs> wonderfully. So the body has all these different parts and all these different function, and it's because you are able to use what God has given you in the context of the local church that we as a body as a whole are able then to go through these doors and then accomplish everything that God has given us to accomplish. By ourselves, we may not think we're much. We may not think we're worthy. We may not think we're valuable. We may not think that there's any purpose or hope in our life. But when we are united together as a family of God for his purpose, then everything that God has gifted you with is for his glory that brings you together so that you can accomplish the goal that he has set forth. And then we as a body of believers are able to do everything that God has called us to do. But it's not as individuals. It's as a body. Paul is pointing that out here in verse 4. It is because of one body that we are able to do this. So the body is not found as an individual. It is because we can't do it alone and we're never meant to do it alone that we are created in a way that this all works best. And may I dare say this truth this morning. You are created for the church and to be a faithful Christian, you must be a part of the church. There is no such thing as a solo or a rogue Christian. Now let me be clear here. Salvation is not based on whether you are united with a local body of believers. This unity is made possible though through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is why Paul then turns at this point to the next phrase. Paul says in verse 4, there is one body and then he says this, there is one spirit. Let's begin by stating the obvious. There is one Holy Spirit. Now, there are many demons, there are many angels, there are, are many aspects of those, but there is only one Holy Spirit, and the power of the Holy Spirit far outweighs legions of demons and angels to the glory of God. It is the power of the Holy Spirit, and only the Holy Spirit, that can bring what was dead to life. So how does the Holy Spirit work in the church? Why does Paul use the Spirit? For the next five hours, we will unpack that. Just kidding. So, but we did spend four weeks uh, at the beginning of the year. So if you didn't miss any of that, we did spend four weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you to check it out. But the focus here specifically is the role of unity. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that brings to life the believer and then unites them with the local and the universal church. So let us rejoice that the confessors of Christ church here that we are with, the church that you are sitting in is a spirit-filled church. However, all churches that are filled with believers are actually spirit-filled churches. And that is incredible because the Holy Spirit takes up residence in all believers and works through all believers for the good of the believers, for the good of the body, and the glory of God. One thing we must be careful of, though, and may I dare say is often the case in our American church culture, is we equate being spirit-filled to emotionalism and mysticism. The Bible nowhere speaks of one being spirit-filled in this manner. One can be animated, excited, dynamic, engaging, and not be spirit-filled. A band can be on point, can be talented, can be energetic, can be loud, could be emotional, and not be spirit-filled. Dare I say that many churches are filled with motivational speakers claiming to be pastors and washed up rock musicians that are more concerned about being on stage than proclaiming the glories of God. Worship services that sing the same watered down choruses 10 times in a row until they can get some sort of tranche is more like new age mysticism than anything that is biblical. Though it may give an emotional high, it's not any different than what I see when I go to concerts. When I see Boys to Men or Bon Jovi or Backstreet Boys. All great concerts, by the way. 
But it's the same exact feeling that you get at a concert as you come before the throne, the king of kings. That should not be. We should not be looking for the same experience that we get in a wave of people cheering, living on a prayer that we should get when we're actually praying to the one that deserves all prayer and glory. Being spirit-filled meant getting everyone, if spirit-filled meant getting everybody on their feet, screaming and yelling, jumping around, then you could come see one of my DJ gigs at Magic Kingdom and you would think the spirit is all up on me. (laughs) However, what is the difference between Pastor Tony and DJ Tony? Thank you for that laugh. (laughs) For our guests here today, I DJ for Magic Kingdom and SeaWorld, so there there is a correlation here. DJ Tony is all about bringing an emotional high based on beats. Pastor Tony is about bringing high God Almighty and setting his glory before you. Pastor Tony gets out of the way and makes sure that you don't look at me, but you look at him. Pastor Tony's emotional. Yeah. Well, didn't rehearse that part. Yes, I get excited. Obviously, I get emotional. And yes, I can sometimes talk fast, but it's because of beholding Jesus together that we get to do this. It's because we lift this up. It's not about a person. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us together. And that is amazing that God in his uh, preeminent knowledge would decide to take people like you and I People that don't deserve anything. People that there's nothing that that I can do alone. But when he unites all of us here together, can accomplish everything. That's incredible. That's incredible. If you are a believer, then you are spirit filled. If a group of believers are united together in the local body, then we are a spirit filled church. And let us remember the role of the Holy Spirit is to apply the plan of the Father through the work of the Son so that the wretched and rebellious sinner, which is myself and all of us here, can turn their heart of stone by the power of the Holy Spirit, turns hearts of stone into heart of flesh, and thus uniting them to the invisible universe church and showing their need of the local church. The Holy Spirit does this. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit unites us. The Holy Spirit seals us. The Holy Spirit guarantees us. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts for the working of the purpose that God has set forth. And check to see if we are truly in the faith. And I'm speaking of Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The invisible church is the global church of believers who only God knows for sure who they are on this earth at this very moment. Those who have had a conversion, who have the Holy Spirit in them, are a part of this universal church. If that is you today, and you are a believer, you're not only a part of this local congregation, but you are a part of what God is doing all over the world at this very moment. And you are participating in the redemption of all things, uniting under Christ. This is an incredible thing that we are a part of. Now, the local body of believers are this universal church in the local context. So, Confessors of Christ Church is a gathering of local believers who are part of this universal, invisible church. Here is where I want to bring forth great caution. Attending Confessors of Christ Church does not mean that you are a part of this universal church. Just because you are sitting here this morning does not make you Christian. It's not mean that because you frequently or occasionally come that you're a Christian. Let me remind you that claiming you are a Christian does not make you a Christian. Let me take one scary step further. Becoming a member of Confessors of Christ Church does not mean that you are a Christian and part of the universal church. Now let me explain. 
Before we accept anyone into membership here, we ask them if they have experienced conversion, if they have been convicted of their sins, if they have repented, if they have put their faith in Jesus and they are prepared to follow him with this local body of believers. Uh, those have been journeying with us. You've rejoiced and celebrated with us as we have done this uh, week after week. But just because I ask the question and one says yes does not mean they are being truthful and that they understand salvation correctly to test whether this is true. This is why I take great time before someone becomes a member to make sure that they understand what is salvation. What is it that God has accomplished? Have you experienced the conviction of sin? Have you put your faith and trust? Have you repented and turned from that which was going against God to that which is towards God? And my goal is not to make everybody in this room doubt their salvation, but my goal is to make sure that you do not believe you are a part of the body because you claim to be a Christian or because you come on Sunday. My goal is to make sure that you're not putting your hope in church membership or church attendance, but that your hope is found in the greatness of God despite your past rejection and sin that have separated you from God, that you have put your faith and trust in Jesus and have repented and believed. And one who has done this has been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and is now a part of the church. So Paul uses the Holy Spirit to help us understand that we are one body, that we are one spirit. And lastly, he says that we have one hope. Now hope is often thought of in its most common use in the American vocabulary. I hope this happens. It's a thought of wishful thinking not really knowing if it is or if it will. We all have those types of hope. I hope that tonight I will find a way to get that hour of sleep back. We have hope. It's wishful thinking. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. It may not. More than likely with the number of kids I have, it's not going to happen. But I have hope that there is a chance. However, biblical hope is a different hope. Biblical hope is a sure and a certain hope. Now the question rightly asked at this point is how does hope have to do with the body and the Holy Spirit? Paul rightly uses this order because the body is made through the Holy Spirit and it is because of the Holy Spirit uniting us to Christ that we have hope for a future. Our future, while uncertain on earth, is very certain upon the transition from this life to the next. While we know we are called to suffer, we are here while we know we are called to suffer while we are here on earth, while we know that we live in a fallen and broken world that is upside down, while we feel the effects of constantly living in a fallen and broken world, while we may lose all of our money, we may lose all of the movement in our body, we may lose our eyesight, and more, we may even lose the family and the things that we cherish the absolute most while we are here on this earth. Even if everything were to vanish from us today, we as believers in Christ have a sure and certain hope of a future day that we will be reunited with God, that we will have every tear wiped away. Revelation 21 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Our hope does not rest in the government. Our hope does not rest in our jobs. Our spouse, our children, our hope doesn't rest in anything except the sure and perfect work of Jesus Christ. The plan of the Father and the Holy Spirit that will be our guarantee until we take possession of it gives us this hope. This morning, what we get to do as a united group of believers is come together to experience this understanding. I hope today that by the end of this, we understand what Paul is doing here is reminding us of this amazing, glorious truth that everybody who puts their faith and trust in who Jesus is, is united together on mission, on purpose for the glory of God and even our good. It's because of what God has put forth from eternity past to now that we get to enjoy the amazing inheritance that God has put forth for us for all of eternity. We get to one day stand before the one who created us, the one who rescued us, the one who united all things, and we get to enjoy him forever. 
And every day we will find more and more glories to praise him. We'll understand what he has done. We will see his attributes clearer and clearer day after day. This is the hope. This is the reason we can get out of bed. This is the reason we can wake up an hour early to sit in these chairs. These are the reasons we can wait just a little bit longer for lunch so that we can behold the glories of God that he has given to us. And this is what you get to be invited into. We are all invited into the story. Every one of you, because you are made in the image of a God, are intrinsically valuable. But God didn't leave it at that. He sent his son to die. He sent his son to reconcile us, to redeem us, to restore us, and to unite us back to where we were. Though we were in rebellion against him, though we have gone our own separate way, it's because of the plan of the Father that we are then able to behold Jesus in this way. And my encouragement for all of us today, all of us here, is to take time to think about what God has done, how he has made us holy and blameless, how he has united us. Take a moment to think of what he has gifted you and done for you that allows you now to be a part of this group of believers. Don't think for a moment that you are not valuable, that you are not worthy, that you do not have anything to give. Because alone by yourself you don't, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the purpose that you have been created for, you have so much that you can now offer. And we invite you into that journey here at Confessors of Christ Church. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful that you have put this plan together, something that we could not do on our own, but yet you have made happen. Lord, we give you all praise and all glory this morning. Father, would you convict in us and our hearts our need of repentance? Would you convict us, our state with you? Would you call us to uh, put our faith and trust into you? And for us that have put our faith and trust, would you sustain us? Would you strengthen us? And would you help us and encourage us on this journey to participate in the bringing of the, all things under Christ? Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.